live. I'm pulling up my Insta right now so I can go live on Insta. Because uh, I'm broadcasting simultaneously in these platforms. And that is a good thing. Because you reach more people that way. And that was, as you heard me say in every broadcast, that is one of my goals for 2021, is to increase my reach. And the reason I want to do that is because whenever the Lord sends a prophetic word, there's my sister, whenever the Lord sends a prophetic word, Get Insta Live going. There we go. I'm live on Insta. What's up, Insta? Whenever the Lord gives a prophetic word, we want that to go out to as many people as possible so it can bless as many as possible. So at 7 o'clock, we're going to get started because I believe in starting on time. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you, O oh God. I come to you, God, submitting myself to the righteousness that is in Christ, O oh God, for Christ is the end of the law unto righteousness unto all that believe. So I thank you for your justification. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you for your goodness, O oh God. Please forgive me for any sin. Wash me clean. By the blood of Jesus, I must decrease so you can increase. So fill me with the Holy Ghost, O oh God. Speak through me. Talk to me. Breathe through me. I surrender my body as a vessel to your God so that what you want to be said will be said. So come through tonight, oh God. We're expecting you to do great things because we need to hear from you. There's ever been a time we need to hear your voice, oh God, it's right now. So breathe through me, speak through me, and let your word go forth as you would have it go forth, that you might get the glory in all things, that you might be glorified, that the saints would be edified, that the demons would be terrified, and that sinners would be mortified to live one more day, one more day apart from you. We thank you for it. We believe you for it. Just like Peter preached and 3,000 got saved, oh God, as the word of God go for, let the spirit of God cut and convict the hearts of all that hear, that they might turn from their own way and turn to you. We thank you for it. We believe you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen and amen. All right. Amen and amen. Tonight is uh, No More Genies, something I do. On the second Thursday of every month, 7 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time. And uh, there's my sister, and there's Sister Sally Butler. So let me say hi to my sister. Sis. Let me say, let me say hey, Sister uh, Butler. Something I do on the second Thursday of every month because <clears throat> if there's anything that we need to break, in the body of Christ. We're not talking about sinners and unbelievers. I'm going to get there in a minute. But if there's anything we need to break in the body of Christ, it's this genie concept of God. The idea that God is a genie, the idea that faith is magic. All you have to do is say the magic words or rub the magic lamp or do the hokey pokey and stick your left foot in and put your right foot out and turn it all about. And somehow God's going to do what you want him to do when this is going to happen. And that's going to happen and a whole bunch of things that aren't biblical, a whole bunch of things that aren't scriptural. So the reason I started this broadcast on Thursday nights is to help us get away from a genie concept of God because the genie concept of God has cost some people their lives. It cost some people the lives of their children. Some people have died because they didn't understand that God wasn't a genie. They didn't understand that God is a person, not a set of rules. They didn't understand how things in the kingdom of heaven work. And some people have died and some people's children have died. That's how dangerous the genie concept of God is. There's story after story of people who said they weren't going to take their children to the hospital and they weren't going to give them medicine because God was going to heal them. God, <laughs> God gives us medicine. God gives us doctors. God gives us uh, antibodies, white blood cells in our bodies to combat sickness. Don't you know that HIV, human uh, uh, immunovirus, means it takes away your body's ability to fight. HIV, when it blows into, blows into AIDS, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, 
it does not mean, uh, what it means is that you lose your ability to fight. So the T cells that take pictures of the antibodies that get in your system that your uh, uh, immune system has to take a picture of to figure out how to fight it, all that is killed and you lose your ability to fight. So healing is built into your body. So why wouldn't God heal you through medicine? Sometimes you get healed through food. Sometimes the sickness you're experiencing is because you're eating something that's allergic to you. I mean, there's all kinds of ways for God to heal. But when you say God has to heal this way, and when you say it's going to happen this way, uh, you don't have a relationship with God. You didn't even ask him. You didn't even ask the Lord, what should I do in this situation? You just said it's going to happen like this. And you just stayed right there until the child died. And just Lord have mercy. And then that's the kind of stuff they put on TV. And that's the kind of stuff like Sister Butler saying they even make movies about. And that's the kind of stuff. And they say, see, see, you Christian people are crazy. You Christian people are extremists. You Christian people are zealots. You Christian people are insane, all the different kind of stuff. How do you square that with the stuff in the Bible? How do you square the stuff we see in the Bible versus stuff like that? I'm going to deal with some of that tonight. I'm going to deal with answering them questions tonight. Because it's not that the answers aren't in scripture. It's that we haven't been taught them. Okay? Don't you have to teach somebody how to read and write? Don't you have to teach your child how to ride a tricycle and then a bicycle? Don't you have to get a license to operate a motorized vehicle? Don't you have to get a license to drive a car? Doesn't somebody have to teach you that? Don't you have to be taught how to cook? Even if you have a natural penchant for cooking, does somebody have to teach you how to take your cooking to the next level? Don't you have to learn how to play an instrument? Even if you are a natural musical genius, don't you have to practice? Do you see how you accept that and all these other areas? And why in the world do you think you don't have to be taught how the kingdom of God works? Why in the world do you think that you don't have to be taught how things work in the spirit? Why do you think that you could just make it work any kind of way you want it to work? That is some kind of magic. That is genie concept. That's not biblical. And that's why I started No More Genies on second Thursday nights, because we need to get rid of that genie concept. We need to get away from that concept and look at what the scripture actually says. Now, tonight's subject is this right here. Where are the miracles? Tonight's subject is where are the miracles? Where are the miracles? Okay, and I'm going to talk about that uh, as we go. Where are the miracles? Now, if you look at some of the stuff that happens in life and you look at some of the stuff that happens in church, and then you look at stuff that happens in the Bible, many times you're going to see that discrepancy. Many times you're going to see that, like, just wait just a minute. Wait just a minute. How can the Bible say all these things and how can all these people in the Bible claim to have had these experiences? And then where is that in real life? Where is that in our lives now? Uh, Y'all forgive this background noise because somebody decided to start their lawn mower right when I started. Of course they did. So forgive me for that background noise. So again, we're going to go into the scriptures and we're going to see what the Bible actually says instead of all that myth-based thinking. Okay because we are supposed to walk in miracles. So let me start off and tell you this. Why do Satan and religious people fight miracles so hard? Why does the devil fight this so hard? Why do religious people, why do they fight this kind of teaching and this kind of thought? Why do they fight it so hard? I'll tell you why. Because what glorifies God the most what glorifies God more than a miracle? For if we were to operate as natural people and we weren't supposed to operate through anything more than our own strength, then what would be the point of becoming saved? And what would be the point of being filled with the Holy Ghost if all we were able to do or all we were supposed to do were just things we can do in our own strength? What's the point of that? See, that doesn't make any sense. There is no point. We're supposed to be operating in the power of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because Father, Son, and Holy Ghost operate in the power of the Holy Ghost. For God said, not by might, not by 
not by power, but by my spirit. So if Father, Son, and Holy Ghost operate by the power of the Holy Ghost, and it's not this big leap that we, the body of Christ, are supposed to be operating by the power of the Holy Ghost. But miracles glorify God. That's why the Lord's life was full of miracles, because it's his power overriding a natural situation, overriding a physical situation, overriding what science says, overriding the limitations of man, overriding everything and showing that he is indeed God. OK, so, of course, the devil is going to fight that. And of course, religious people are going to fight that. And I'm going to make this point again later, but I want to drop this point now because this point is in my spirit very strong. That's why I'm going to visit it again later. But I want you to remember what I'm about to say right here. All those people that tell you that God isn't real and Jesus isn't real and miracles aren't real and the Bible aren't real. I want you to ask them one question. Here it is. What do they have for you? All the people telling you that you can't get up out of a wheelchair and you can't have a baby and miraculous healing don't happen and blah, 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 blah. What do they have for you? Okay, we're going to see that later on when we get into the scriptures about the Pharisees that follow Jesus. What do they have for them people? They were steady criticizing the Lord and the Lord steady casting out demons, steady opening blinded eyes, steady pulling people up that were paralytic and lame. The Lord was steady bringing deliverance to people. And the people that criticized him, what did they have? That's going to mess with your mind. You need to meditate on that. I'm going to visit it again later during this hour. But you need to meditate on the critics and how they say that the Bible isn't real and Jesus isn't real. And you Christian people are crazy and that doesn't have all the kind of stuff they say. I want you to ask them, what do they have for you? If all this ain't real and blah, 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 what's their solution? What they got? How many people they pull out of a wheelchair? How many people did they have where the woman was infertile or the man was infertile and the couple had a baby or the couple was just old? How many fire survivors? How many people came back from the dead? If they saying that all this ain't right and all this ain't real, what do they have for you is my question. And that's what you need to ask them the next time you hear somebody criticize and say, I don't believe you believe in all that Jesus stuff. And somebody told me one time, David, you're too intelligent to believe the Bible. <laughs> I'll get to that later. So the next time they bring all that to you, I want you to ask them, what do they have for you? Because some of y'all looking at me right now, myself included, you know you wouldn't even be alive now if it weren't for the miracle power of God, if God didn't reach his mighty hand in a situation and save your life and bring you back from the edge of death, okay? I'm not talking what I think, I'm talking what I know because I'm a fire survivor, okay? I like the way Dr. Jasmine Schoolart at Bishop Jake's church says it. She says, you don't think I've been through nothing because I don't look like what I've been through. Me and my son are fire survivors. I had to run out of a burning apartment building with nothing on with my hand in front of my face like that. And there's not a scratch on me. Okay? So that's just one. So that's what I mean when I tell you. The next time those critics start talking about how this stuff isn't real, what do they have for you? Okay? So Satan and religious folks and unbelievers are always going to speak against this kind of thing. And I'm going to show you why they do that. And I'm going to show you why you don't listen to that. But it's a part of the landscape because it happened to Jesus too. Everybody that walked in miracles, there was somebody around bad-mouthing them. But I want you to always think about the people that bad mouth. What do they have for you? And the next time they bad mouth your faith, what do they have for you? That's why Elisha put them out. That's why Jesus put them out. There's definitely times in the Bible where they was fitting to raise somebody from the dead and all the people that was hollering and mourning and speaking against and all that, they put their mouth to room, raised the child from the dead and came back out to room with the dead person come back to life. Jesus did that and Elisha did that. Yes, they did. So the devil, wicked people, unbelievers are always going to fight this. But what do they have for you? Satan doesn't have anything for you but destruction. Unbelievers and religious people don't have anything for you but criticism, which leads me to the, my next point. The reason that miracles glorify God the most 
is because they are unmistakable displays of his power. And there is no person sent from God that won apart from the power of God. That's why the devil fights it so hard. I'm going to say that one more time. There's nobody in the scriptures that won, that won apart from the power of God. What do you mean by that, Prophet Taylor? Moses. I'll get Moses going out there and stick his finger in the face of Pharaoh. And Pharaoh just did behead him on the spot. Anybody else tried that? They just whoop him. Remember Michael Jackson, remember the time video where Iman was like off with his head and whoop him? How come Pharaoh didn't do that? Because Moses was walking in the power of God, that's why. Samuel, Samson, Elijah, Elisha, Apostle Paul, Jesus himself, Daniel, the three Hebrew boys. How could Daniel survive the lion's den apart from the power of God? How could the three Hebrew boys survive the power of fire, the fiery furnace that was heated up even seven times hotter? And the Lord was in the, in the flames with them. How could they survive that apart from the power of God? That's why the devil does not want you to develop your faith in this area. Because there's nobody that won. When, when the enemies of Israel came against Israel in the Old Testament and they began to praise God, the Lord set ambushments against the enemies to the point where many times they turned their swords on themselves. Or sometimes they heard a noise, the noise of the, all the angels around them, and they ran. See, no believer wins apart from the power of God. That's why the devil wants you to sell, settle for having religion. Because religion is just about form and fashion and order of service and the traditions of men, but ain't no power in it. That's why when you're around religious people, you wheel people in church and you wheel them out of church. And people walk in on crutches and people leave out on crutches. And women walk in infertile and they leave out infertile. That's religion because they don't have nothing for you. As opposed to Jesus, because that never happened in the Lord's life. There was never anybody that they brought to the Lord for a miracle that came back empty handed, that didn't get the healing that they need, that left away from Jesus the same way they were when they met him. If we're his body, we're supposed to do that. Okay? So uh, under my opening point, why does the devil fight this so hard? Point number one, because the miracle power of God glorifies God the most. But point number two, as a believer, you can't win apart from the power of God. Okay? And let me throw this in as a side. This is why people stop coming to church. Oh, Prophet Taylor, you messing, you messing with people now. You meddling now. Yeah, I don't care. That's what prophets do. <clears throat> this is why people stop coming to church. When you go to the grocery store, you want some groceries, don't you? When you go to the schoolhouse, you want an academic education, don't you? Well, when you come to the house of God, how are you not supposed to get the word of God, the rightly divided word of truth? How are you not supposed to get, okay, see, the Holy Ghost is telling me there's going to be some miracles on this broadcast tonight. Before I'm done talking, it's going to be some miracles. Watch. Watch. <clears throat> How can you go to the house of God and the power of God is not there? That's why people stop coming to church. Because when we go through a global pandemic and we're isolated and we can't even get to the house of God and everything we do, we have to do online, okay? Then your faith needs to be working so the power of God can manifest wherever you are. But when you come to the house of God and you can't even hear the word of truth, you can't even see sick people being healed, you can't even see people throw their crutches down, you can't even see people get up out of wheelchairs, you can't even see couples that have been infertile for years have a baby, then people just disconnect, okay? Because all you giving them is religion, form and fashion. And you want to know how you mark religious people? You mark religious people, number one, because they always hate the Holy Ghost. They're, when the Spirit of God begins to move, there are always the people sitting up there with their face thrown up, talking about, it don't take all that. Them as religious people, one. Number two, uh, the, oh, hey, uh, there's my niece. Hey, my cousin niece. How you doing, Lexus? On Insta. Uh, that's always religious people. They're always the ones sitting up there with their face round up. Somebody don't take all that when the spirit of God begins to move, number one. Number two, religious people never come out of themselves and praise God. I want you to think about that. Whenever you see somebody giving God the glory, 
when you come out of yourself, you stop caring about how you look. Religious people never do that. They never do that. Okay? Because religious people hate the Holy Ghost and they hate giving God the glory. Number three, the way you mark a religious person is they're always arguing about form and fashion. They say stuff like, no, first we read the scripture, then we do the prayer. No, no, the worship team only gets to sing two songs. They argue about stuff like that. No, no, pastor got to be up by 1120 because pastor got to be done by 1150. They argue about stuff like that. That's religious people. Religious people don't have no room in their life for the Holy Ghost because if you know the spirit of God, you have to surrender and let the Holy Ghost have his way. And you might be in church longer than you plan. But so what? If that's what it takes to get a miracle. See, but religious people are always fighting that. They got their face frowned up. When the spirit of God begins to move, they never come out of themselves and give God the glory without worrying about how they look. And they're always arguing about the order of service. That's how you mark religious people, in case you were wondering. Now, can I back all that up with scripture? Yes, I can, because I wouldn't have brought it up if I couldn't back it up. We're going to go to 2 Timothy. We're going to go to 2 Timothy. All right. Here comes 2 Timothy. Now listen to this right here. <clears throat> 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. I'm going to start at verse 1. I'm probably going to read down to maybe about verse 9. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. In each one of these passages, when you read the scripture, when you actually read the word of God, you will discover that there is so much to unpack. So I don't have time to unpack everything in the scripture because it's a lot, okay? But here we go. 2 Timothy chapter three, verses one to about nine, and I'm reading out of the New International Version. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, AKA the selfie generation, Bo uh, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving. Just go on Twitter if you think people aren't unforgiving. Slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but, den but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people. Not good God Almighty. Now, wait just a minute. Paul said to Timothy that terrible times in the last days, then he lists all these things, which is why I keep telling you that don't listen to people that, that tell you that the Bible isn't relevant now. All that stuff I just read, you trying to tell me that stuff isn't happening right now? Uh, lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful pride, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous. What do you think cancel culture is? People going back in your past 20 years ago, 20 years ago, talking about stuff Mistakes you made 20 years ago, trying to put you on blast now. Without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, Lord have mercy, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. How is that not talking about the 21st century? How can somebody say the Bible isn't relevant right now? But then it says, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. Do you know what that means? That means Paul is talking about the religious people. Oh my goodness, you missed it. Paul said all them things he's talking about, he's talking about religious people. Religious people love themselves and love money, both for proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful and holy without love. Having a form of godliness, that's religious people. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power, that's religious people. You would think <laughs> at surface glance that a list like that would be talking about unbelievers and sinners, but Paul said they're having a form of godliness. So either Paul means that a whole bunch of people like all that stuff, and then there's other people that have a form of godliness, or he means that people that think they have a form of godliness, all that stuff applies to them. Either way you interpret that, it says they're, they're going to have a form, they're going to look all religious on the surface, but they ain't got no power. Paul said have nothing to do with such people. Paul said don't have anything to do with folks like that. Okay. Because as a Christian, like I said, you need the power of God to win. Why would you hang around people that don't believe in the power of God? Why? Why? 
Doesn't make any sense. Uh, verse six, they are the kind who warm their way into homes and gain control over gullible women who are loaded down with sins and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires, always learning, but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. So in other words, uh, they they got hookups going on and they're trying to do hookups. They're trying to get with you know certain people, whatever. Uh, but then verse seven is what I want to focus on. It says always learning, but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. You don't want to be one of those Christians that went to church for 20 years and didn't learn nothing. How, how are you going to go to church for 20 years? How are you going to sit down on the word of God for 20 years? You didn't learn nothing. How are you going to be the same person now that you were 20 years ago? Okay. So you don't want to be always learning. In other words, you never graduate. How many years do you want your child to go to fourth grade? Approximately. That will be one year. Then they're supposed to move on. You're supposed to graduate from elementary school. You're supposed to graduate from junior high school. You're supposed to graduate from high school. And then if you do any type of advanced degrees, two year, uh, military, tech school, training school, two year university, four year university, you're supposed to graduate. As it is in the natural, so it is in the spirit. Can you do more in the spirit now than you could 10 years ago? What about two years ago? What about 2019? Can you do more in the spirit now? Do you know more about God and his kingdom? Have you developed your faith to the point where you're able to do more now than you could two years ago? Okay, why do we expect and accept graduation in the academic area of our lives? but we do not accept or expect graduation in the spiritual area of our lives. Don't nobody think that way, but religious people. Religious people are the people that go to church for 20 years and do the same thing. Religious people are the people that don't sing a new song unto the Lord. They wanna sing them songs we sang 30 years ago. Religious people do that because they're in love with tradition. They're in love with form and fashion. They're in love with the order of service. They're in love with denominationalism. They're in love with, we've always done it this way. What if the Lord shifts? What if the spirit of God moves? What if the head of the church moves to another place and expects his body to follow? Who gonna fight that? The religious people. Cause they just have a form. They just godly on the outside, but they don't have no power. Prophet Taylor, how can you make a statement like that? Because I have seen the power of God move in my life and my family, that's how. I'll give you two testimonies. Well, I gave you one already. I'm a fire survivor, me and my son. I had to run out of a burning building while I was trying to pull my sweatshirt on with nothing in front of me but my forearm. And we both survived. One. Number two, I got healed of angina when I was 25 years old. If you don't know what angina is, it's a disease that makes your blood vessels constrict. And the doctor said, when you get it, you can have a heart attack and take you out like that. And the Holy Ghost spoke to me while I was on my way to get my medicine and said, you don't have to get that medicine. I said, what did you say? He said, you don't have to get that medicine. I said, well, what am I supposed to do? He, uh, I had been to my friend, the prophet. The power of God came on him. He laid his hands on me and he said, in the name of Jesus Christ, you're healed. I didn't feel anything. On my way to get the medicine, the Lord said, you don't have to get the medicine. I said, what do I have to do? He said, just believe. So I said, okay, and I believe. And I felt the power of God shoot out through my heart and open up my blood vessels. I'm still here now, ain't I? Because it's been a minute since I was 25. I ain't been 25 in a minute. I'm still serious looking at you right now, aren't I? I got here from angina with no medicine, okay? That's number two. Number three, I'm not going into details because I'm not going to tell other people's business, but in my family, there have been major medical miracles. And I'm not talking about 10 years ago. I'm not talking about 20 years ago. I'm talking about just a couple months ago. Just a couple months ago, we had some situation in the family and we called on the name of the Lord and we called on the power of God and God came through twice. Again, I'm not gonna tell somebody else's testimony. I'm telling you that this is not years ago. This is just a few weeks ago, just a few months ago. We called on the name of the Lord as a family and God brought a healing miracle twice. First miracle, person was in a hospital and all this stuff was going on. They left the same day. 
After we prayed and called on the Lord, they miraculously got healed and the hospital discharged them the same day. So that's what I mean when I say, I'm not just pulling this stuff out of thin air. I'm not just making this stuff up. That's what I started off the broadcast by saying, they're always talking about you crazy Christian people and you can't prove your God is real. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. You can't prove all that stuff in the Bible is true. Yes, we can. I've seen it in myself, in my life. You can tell me what you believe, but you can't tell me what I saw. You can tell me what you believe, but you can't tell me what I've been through. You can tell me what you believe, but you can't tell me because my family would testify. If I had all my family on this broadcast right now, they tell you what I'm talking about. So that's what I mean when I say this is real and this is now. So, but the devil does not want people to walk in this because I told you before, miracles glorify God the most. But number two, you can't win apart from the power of God. That's why the devil don't want you to walk in miracles because everybody that won, won because of the supernatural power of God. Moses could not have delivered a nation from slavery. Just let that hit. Some estimates say it was about half a million Hebrews. Some say 600,000. Some say 1.2 million Jews left Egypt under Moses. And also there were actually some Egyptians that left Egypt and went with the Hebrews. That's in the scripture. So whether it was a half a million all the way up to 1.2 million, the point is I want you to think about one man with his brother Aaron going down there and sticking his finger in the face of Pharaoh talking about let my people go. <laughs> Moses won because of the power of God. How else could one man with his brother deliver half a million to 1.2 million people from being slaves? Please explain that to me in natural terms. Okay, so, so that's my opening point. Here come a uh, next point. Miracles are the norm for the Christian. They are the norm for the Christian. In other words, we're supposed to walk in them. I said it before, if we're going to get saved and then still live like regular people, what was the point of getting saved? We might as well just get saved and die so we can just go on to heaven. But see, God has us on earth because he has stuff for us to do. But the stuff that we do, and, and Holy Ghost is telling me to say it again, there's going to be some miracles on this broadcast. Before I'm through talking, there's going to be some miracles. <clears throat> The Lord keeps us on earth because he has a life for us to live, and that life is meant to be lived supernaturally. Now, let me hasten to say that, of course, there is balance. Of course, you have to do your regular stuff in the natural, so don't stop brushing your teeth and stop, don't stop using deodorant because you just got so deep, you think that, you know, being y'all whatever with bad hygiene glorifies God. Yeah, no. <laughs> don't stop exercising and don't stop eating fruits and vegetables. Yeah, no. So I'm not talking about getting crazy. <laughs> I'm talking about things that we're supposed to do that can only be done by the power of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Ghost doesn't do stuff for you that you can do for yourself, okay? If you're trying to plant a garden in your backyard, the Lord will bless your seed, but the Lord is not gonna plant the seeds for you. You have to till the dirt. You have to plant the seeds. You have to water the seed and then God gives an increase. God ain't gonna do for you the stuff you can do. So don't be listening to crazy people, okay? But uh, miracles are the norm for the Christian. Uh, Mark 16, 17 through 18, reading the King James Version. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So right there, what's supposed to mark our lives? The Lord said, these signs, well, what's a sign? A sign is pointing you to something. A sign is marking something. When you're trying to get off the highway, you look for the sign. When it's time to stop, because there's a stop sign. So the Lord said, this is a marker. This is a pointer. The Lord said, these markers, these pointers follow people that believe. Believe what? Believe him. He said, in my name, in Jesus' name, they cast out devils. If you're a Christian, you're supposed to be walking in deliverance ministry. You can do self-deliverance, meaning if you have any unclean spirits in your house or on your person, you can break them off you. You do not have to live 
under the oppression of unclean spirits if you're a Christian, if you didn't know that. Uh, they shall speak with new tongues. New tongues does not always mean prayer language. Prayer language is how much I see my kind of machine and my kind of like that. that. Sometimes that's talking about literally other languages, like English is your main language, and then miraculously you learn how to speak German or Spanish or Latin or Japanese. It means that. Remember that the miracle of Pentecost was not prayer language. It was not Hanama Kikama Hanama Shaya Mashua. It wasn't that. The miracle of Pentecost was that all the people that heard them heard them in their own language. Okay? So sometimes it's not talking about prayer language. Sometimes it's talking about literally multilingual ability. It says they shall take up serpents. Now, got to pause on that one. There's this group that dances in church and sticks their hands in a serpent's nest and gets bit. And they're, you know, they believe in getting, okay. That falls under the category of the Lord said, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Just because the Lord said you can take up serpents doesn't mean you go find poisonous steaks and stick your hand in a snake basket. That's not what that means. That's like when the devil told Jesus to throw himself off the mountain. And the Lord said, that's not what that, just because God promise you, promises you angelic protection, it doesn't mean you throw yourself off a mountain and then demand that God catch you. Just because the Lord said you can take up serpents doesn't mean you're supposed to go find poison snakes and then see how many times you can get bit. Because I told you, religious people just get crazy. This means that you don't have to fear. You don't have to fear this kind of stuff. Not go somewhere and find some poison snakes and see how much venom you can take. That's not, that's not what Jesus said because that's not what he did. If that's what the Lord meant, he would have done it. And that's why you have to know the Lord for yourself as a person. If you know anything about Father God, and if you know anything about Jesus, you know that anything they ask you to do, they did it first. Father God is the perfect father. Jesus is the perfect leader. There's nothing that Jesus Christ ever commands you to do that he didn't do first. When he tells you to love your enemies, he did that first. When he tells you to take up your cross, he took up his cross. When Father tells you to make a sacrifice, he made a sacrifice of Jesus. There's nothing that they tell us to do that they didn't do first. Never forget that. So that's why when you see people taking the Bible out of context and doing crazy things, ask yourself, did the Lord do that? <laughs> They're trying to say, well, the Bible says, yeah, well, the devil quoted the Bible too in Matthew 4. Okay? So did the Lord go somewhere and stick his hand in a basket full of poisonous snakes? Nope. Okay, so it says, they shall drink any deadly thing, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. That's another one. These same people, they drink strychnine, they drink poison, and talking about if you're really a person of faith, you won't die. That ain't, <laughs> did Jesus do that? Is there anywhere in scripture where the Lord went somewhere and got some poison and said, I'm going to show y'all, I know what I'm talking about, and they drink, that ain't what, that's not what that means. That means the same thing that, uh, I believe it was Elisha, where they had food poisoning, and they said there was death in the pot. So Elisha got a little bit of salt and threw it in the pot and the food got healed. So in other words, that's why you're supposed to say your grace before you eat. Uh, another personal testimony, a friend of mine way back in, uh, when I first went to college when I was 18, 19 years old. Friend of mine, they made fun of her for saying her grace before her meal. She was in the cafeteria one time. She said her grace, that particular meal, everybody in the cafeteria got food poisoning except her. Because that's what happens when you honor God before your meal. That's what it means. If they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. That means you bless your food. You say your grace over your food, okay? So that God can bless your food. Not you purposely go out and find uh, uh, deadly things to eat and drink and then eat them. That's tempting God. That's not what that means. Then it says they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. That's pretty self-explanatory. So if there's any sickness around you, you're supposed to lay hands on it. You're supposed to lay hands on it and through faith, believe that God will bring the people all the way back. Okay? So I know what you're asking. I know what you're asking. You're asking me, why, does, why doesn't this happen more often? And why don't all Christians, or at least more Christians, do this? I'm going to get to that in a minute. I'm still under my next point. Miracles are the norm for Christian. Here, here uh, is my next scripture. 
John 14 and 12. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Now, if you don't know anything about the scripture, when the Lord says, and when the Bible says, verily, verily, that's another way of saying truly, truly. So whenever God repeats a word, he's trying to emphasize what's coming next. He's trying to make, a, make you recognize there's a very strong point coming next. So the Lord says, truly, truly, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. There it is right there. There is your biblical proof that Christians are supposed to do the same things Jesus did out of Jesus' own mouth. And then it says, and greater works than these shall he do. That word there, greater, it means expansive or larger. So I've always interpreted that, understood that to mean because the Lord died when he was 33 and because the Lord was only in one place in one time when he walked the earth as a man. He said, greater works than these shall he do because I go to my father. So in other words, the Lord went back to heaven and sent back the Holy Ghost and the Holy Ghost is literally Jesus with us. So in other words, the body of Christ worldwide, when we live longer than 33, that means we have more time to do more of the stuff that Jesus did, okay? Because I don't know how you get too much greater than raising the dead. So that means larger, more expansive. We can do much more of what the Lord did. But the key to that operation is in the verse, and that's the part that people miss. It says, Very, verily, verily, or truly, truly, John 14, 12, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, there it is. He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. That's going to lead me to my next point. But the Lord said the prerequisite is that you have to believe. This is where sinners or unbelievers or carnal Christians or religious people, this is the part they always miss. I heard my pastor say one time that somebody asked him, if you Christians believe in so much in that divine healing, why don't you clear out the hospitals? Why don't you just go on, go in the hospitals and just clear them all out? Just heal all the sick people and just raise them up. That's a legitimate question. That's a good question. Why not? Here's the answer. The answer is, is because there must be an atmosphere of faith. That's why I told you I started this broadcast so we can get rid of a genie concept. You think that God is going to heal you apart from what you believe. That is incorrect. It's not magic. The Lord is a gentleman. He does not force his love or his grace on anybody. Meaning God requires something of you to receive a miracle. And one of the things that God requires from you is faith. That is why faithless people don't get any miracles. It doesn't fail. All the people that are bad mouthing and all the people that are talking negative and all the people that are critical are not walking in any kind of faith. That's why they don't see it because they keep thinking that it's magic, that God is just gonna wave his hand and do all this stuff. That is not how the Lord operated when he walked to earth as a man. Because when the Lord went to his hometown, the Bible, hometown, the Bible says very clearly, he could do no mighty works there because of their unbelief. It did not say he could do no mighty works there because of his lack of power. It did not say he could do no mighty works there because he wasn't willing. He said, the scripture said he could do no mighty works there in his hometown of Nazareth because of their unbelief. That's what people don't want to accept. That's why I started this broadcast, No More Genies. No more genie concept of God. No more thinking that is magic. No more thinking that God is going to superimpose something. I heard Bishop Jake say it one time, and I love the way he said it, because he was talking about something similar to this. And he was talking about, why doesn't this happen? Why doesn't that happen? Bishop Jake looked right at the camera and said, because God don't move over on top of your will. That's why. That's why. A whole lot of people are talking about what they want from God, but they're not listening to the Lord, asking the Lord, what are you requiring of me in this mix? What is it that you want me to do? Because when you study the scripture, there was always something that the people that wanted the miracle had to do. No exceptions. There are no exceptions in the Bible of someone that got a miracle over on top of their will. In other words, the Lord just slapped a miracle on. Yeah, I'm just going to give you this miracle. That did not happen. Even a woman with the issue of blood because the Lord wasn't looking at her. She pulled the miracle out of Jesus because she kept confessing 
of faith. If I may but touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. And then she reached out and she got it. There's not one person or situation in the Bible where a miracle happened, where they got it over on top of their will, where God superimposed, superimposed his will on top of theirs. That's the missing piece. I told you I was going to clear it up tonight. That's the missing piece. That's why unbelievers don't see the power of God because they don't believe it. That's why carnal Christians, people that are born again, but their faith is, isn't developed. They're in kindergarten. They have kindergarten levels of faith. That means you had just enough faith to get saved. You're in the kingdom, but your faith is at a kindergarten level. You haven't developed it. That's why people that are uh, scoffers and mourners, uh, excuse me, scoffers and uh, mockers, okay, and people that make fun, that's why they don't see the power of God, because they don't believe, because God requires something of you. Let me give you a principle once and for all. You have to participate in your own miracle. <laughs> One more time, you have to participate in your own miracle. I know you can't stand that, because that's busting up your whole genie concept of God, okay? You have to participate in your own miracle. That's the principle. If you refuse to believe God, if you refuse to obey God, if you refuse to do what the Lord is telling you to do, then ain't no miracle coming your way. That is not God's fault. That's not the Bible's fault. It's just that miracles don't work the way you thought they should work because you thought it's like Aladdin's lamp. I just rub the lamp and I just say what I want. It just happens. That's not the truth. That's not the truth. You have to participate. There's no miracle, I'll say it again, in the scriptures where the person involved in the miracle didn't have to do nothing because this, this is not magic, which leads me to my final point for the night, which, well, excuse me, my second and final point, because I have one more after this one. How exactly do miracles work? Now, we got to go to Romans 10. There's so much here in Romans 10 I would like to unpack, but I do not have time tonight. But you'll see what I mean when I read it. I'm going to start out with just one scripture, and then I'm going to show you how people mess this up big time. I'm going to quote a very famous scripture among Christians. Those of you that read the Bible and hang around church, hang around church folks, you've heard this a lot. But then I'm going to do something that you may not have heard. Romans 10 and 17 says, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Raise your hand if you've heard that a million times. Have you heard that a million times? Have you heard that a million times in church? Have you heard that on, on live broadcasts, live streams, online revivals, wherever you are around that? Have you heard a million times somebody quote Romans 10 and 17 saying, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God? Raise your hand if you heard that a million times. You know what I'm fitting to do now? I'm fitting, <laughs> I'm fitting to read the verses around it. I'm fixing, I'm fitting to read the verses around that verse. It's going to change your whole everything. Are you ready? Romans chapter 10, verse 1, Brother, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Right there, the Bible just told you that you can be zealous about God and not know what you're talking about. I'm not laughing. The Bible just told you that you can be on fire for Jesus and, and don't bit more know what you're talking about than my left shoe know how to be right. A zeal of God, but not according to knowledge, not according to what the word says, not according to what the Lord says. The Bible just told you that you can be that way. Verse three, for they being ignorant, uh, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness, righteousness of God. But they being ignorant, ignorant means to not know something. So it means they don't know God's righteousness. They're going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Verse four, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. In other words, the Bible, the whole New Testament is trying to get you to understand that you don't earn your salvation. You are not saved by works. You're not saved by anything that you do. You can't keep the law. The reason God gave us the law, the 10 commandments, was to show us that we all fall short, not to try to give us something to try to strive for to save ourselves. You can't save yourself. 
You can't make yourself be righteous. The whole end of mankind trying to make himself right in the eyes of God is Jesus. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. So you got people going around trying to lift themselves up, always talking about what they do and what they don't do. Uh, uh, talking about how, you know, they got their big X2s cross on, they cross so heavy. You can break a window with it, they cross so heavy that they, you know, getting neck pains and all that. And they got arthritis wearing that heavy cross because they think that makes them more holy. They think that makes them more saved. A woman walking around looking at women that might wear, have a dress or a skirt on that's right below the knee and women that have on them dresses that come down to the ankle saying that they more saved and more holy than the women wearing dresses, you know, because some people are saved and some people are super saved. And then people that are super saved, they want to let you know that they are more saved than you. Okay? You ain't saved because of what you do. You didn't get saved because of what you do. You don't stay saved because of what you do. You got saved by the grace of God. And then God, by his grace, gives you the ability to live the way he wants you to live. You got saved by grace. You live by grace. You die by grace is all the grace of God. It doesn't mean we don't have to live right. It means we don't live right under our own power. Lord, have mercy. People don't understand the New Testament. It doesn't mean you don't have to obey God. It doesn't mean you can live any kind of way. That's not what grace means. Grace means that you don't have to try to obey God in your own strength. So if you're struggling with anything in the Bible, you have to ask God, say, Lord, you have to help me do this. That's what grace is for. You see? Verse 5, when Moses describes the righteousness, which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. But the righteousness, which is of faith, speaking on this wise, say not in thy heart, who shall ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down from above? Who shall descend into the deep, that is, to bring Christ up again from the dead? But what says it? What says it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is, the word of faith, which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, Thou shalt be saved. For with the heart, man believes unto the righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whosoever believes on him shall not be ashamed. For there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Here it comes. Verse 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed in the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord has, who hath believed our report. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It looks different to you now, don't it? Right, because you read the verse in context. The Bible said there's steps. There's steps. So in other words, the Lord said, you got to, verse 13, you got to call on him. But the only way you can call on the Lord is you got to believe in him. But then the Bible says, the only way you can believe in Jesus is if you heard of him. And then the Bible says that how can you hear about Jesus without a preacher? In other words, somebody got to come preach, teach, and prophesy the Lord to you. Remember how I started off by saying you have to learn how things work in the kingdom? And then it says, and how shall they preach except they be sent? In other words, God is the one that assigns the apostolic, the prophetic, evangelical, pastoral, and teaching. God is the one that established those offices. And the Holy Spirit is the one that puts people in them. And the Holy Spirit is the one that empowers people to do what they do. So in other words, you can't jump up and declare yourself to be a pastor. That's why so many people's ministries don't have no power. God ain't called them the pastor. They said they was a pastor. You can't bit most of, make yourself a pastor just because you say so. It's the Holy Ghost. There's steps. Then it says, so then faith comes by here. Now you see why so many people don't get the miracles that they need because they don't do all the steps. You have to call on the Lord's name. But you can't call on him unless you believe in him. And you can't believe in him if you've never heard of him. And you can't have heard of him unless somebody preached or prophesied or taught him to you. And But you can't preach or teach or prophesy unless God sends you. It's the power of the Holy Ghost that makes a difference, not you. And then it says that, that uh, then faith comes by hearing. So in other words, all in steps have to be there. 
That's why you get all these people who've been doing what they've been doing for 20 years and ain't no miracles nowhere around. Because you can't call yourself. I wish you would try to call yourself a prophet. <laughs> Do it, nobody volunteer to be no apostle or prophet. That's why God don't ask you. God makes you an apostle or prophet before you're born, and then he calls to what he already put inside of you. But then people that that <laughs> that try to give themselves mantles and try to make themselves and I, mm, that's why they ain't got no power. And those are the people that they're always going to put on TV. Them false prophets and false apostles. They're going to say, see, see, they're going to put them people on TV. Uh-huh. If Reverend Harrison was still alive, I wish I would put Reverend Harrison on TV. Then you see some miracles right in front of me. All right. So uh, moving on, uh, Mark 9 and 23. We're going to go to Mark 9 and 23. Mark 9 and 23 says, uh, well, Mark, let's read 21, 22, and uh, 23. <clears throat> Peter remembered it and said, look, Rabbi, the fig tree you curse has withered. When the Lord was passing by before, there's a fig tree that was barren, and the Lord cursed it. Uh, and Peter, when they were walking back, Peter said, Jesus, look, the fig tree you curse has withered. And the Lord said, have faith in God. Some translations say, have faith from God, Berean literal Bible. Um <clears throat> The Aramaic Bible in plain English says, Yeshua answered and he said unto them, may the faith of God be in you. I've heard some people teach that and say, have the faith of God. But the point I'm trying to make is in verse 23, truly I tell you, there's our word truly, that if anyone says to this mountain, be lifted up and thrown into the sea and has no doubt in his heart, but believes that it will happen, it will be done for him. So the Lord gave you the prerequisite for your miracle in verse 22, the Lord spoke to the fig tree and the fig tree dried up. Why? Because he believed that it would. Verse 22, the Lord says, have faith in God, have faith from God. Some have said, have the faith of God. The Amplified Bible says, have faith in God constantly. So in other words, it's your faith <laughs> that makes the fig tree dry up. God's power is always there. God's power is always on, like his physical laws are always on. Gravity, velocity, combustion, okay? They're always on, right? His spiritual laws are always on, but you have to believe to tap into what's already there. That's the missing piece. You're not going to get what you say if you don't believe it. You are going to get what you believe. That's why people that are always negative always have negative things happen to them. You ever notice that? You ever notice that people that are always having negative confession uh, get exactly what they confess because they're believing negatively. That's why negative things happen because it's according to your faith. It's according to your faith. Your faith has to tap into what God is already there. Now, let me show you what I mean when I say what's already there. Okay, we're going to go to Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 3. There's another very very common passage, but you need to hear what I'm saying now. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 3. Now, faith is the assurance of what we hope for and the certainty of what we do not see. Some uh, translations say, now, faith is the confidence in what we hope for. That was New International. New Living Translation said, faith shows the reality of what we hope for. Uh, verse 2, 11 and 2 says, this is why the ancients were commended. In other words, the people that lived in the Bible in old times, this is why they got commended because they believed. It says, by faith, we understand that the universe or the world, or more properly, the ages were formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. There it is right there. So when it says, the King James Version said, by faith, we understand that the worlds were framed, but the word there in Hebrew, they translate a universal world, but it also means age or extension. So in other words, it doesn't just mean, you know, the sun, Mercury, the earth, Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune, Pluto. It doesn't just mean that. It does mean that, but it also means like the times and the seasons, like, like the different ages of man, like, the, like eternity and time. It means uh, all of the things that exist in each one of their stages were actually made by the word of God. But listen to the end of verse two, excuse me, verse three.
by faith, we understand that the universe was formed or the ages was formed at God's command. Here it is. So that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. <clears throat> There's the whole key. When God says something, it exists in the invisible. Where we need it is out here in the visible. Faith is the thing that pulls it from the invisible to the visible because that's how God made everything. Good God Almighty. Once the Lord started, because the Lord has to do, the Lord is working on us every day of our life until we die. The Lord is always trying to get us out of our thinking and get us into his thinking. Once the Lord started showing me that the creatures don't tell the creator how things work, that I'm just the clay, I don't tell the potter how it go, the potter tells me how it go, that opens up everything once you realize that nothing has to work the way you think it should work. Nothing has to be what you think it is because you didn't invent it. The Bible says that the stuff that's seen was not made out of what was visible. Do you understand what the scripture is saying to you? What the scripture is saying to you is that everything out here, whether it's the times or the season or trees or rain or human beings or cherry lollipops or the sun or comets or bullfrogs or whatever you want to talk about, that didn't come from physical substance. It came from invisible to the visible. The Bible just told you everything God made, he made it that way. That means that the same way God operated by pulling what he wanted from the invisible to the visible by his faith, that's why God said, let there be light. Why did God say, let there be light if light was already there and invisible? Because he wanted it out here. And then the Bible says they shaped and molded it and he turned the light in the sun, moon, and stars because he wanted it out here. If God said, let there be light and light comes from the invisible to the visible, if that's the way he made everything, then that's how we are supposed to get our miracles. We have to pull them from the invisible to the visible. Now, the best news you've heard all day is that if there's something God says in the Bible, that means it exists in the invisible world. What's the difference between people? The difference between people is that some people have enough faith to pull what God said out here into their lives, and some people don't. The difference is not God, because God is no respecter of person. We read that in Romans 10, remember? There's either neither Jew nor Greek. In other words, there's no ethnic boundary with God. There's no gender boundary with God. There's no age boundary with God. God is not a respecter. It's not your demographics that make you right or wrong in the eyes of God. <clears throat> so that means if you've ever wondered what the difference is between Christians, some Christians have not developed their faith. That's why they just accept these situations. But they make the mistake sometimes of saying, oh, it was the will of God. Not if it's not in the scriptures, it's not. So many people have settled for less in their lives as believers. Okay, the Holy Ghost, give me something I got to say. I got to lose a ring word in a second. So many people have settled for less in, in their lives as believers because they have said things that aren't in the scriptures. And so they end up, like I've seen people say, well, I guess we're have, having kids because that was the will of God because the woman got sick or something. You ain't done having kids, you just accepted that. Abraham and Sarah had kids, Abraham was 100, Sarah was 90. You can have kids as long as you wanna have kids. Okay, all right, here comes the rainbow word of God. For behold my, behold my people, I call you unto me to move in this dimension of miracles. It is a time of miracles. It is a time where I desire to show myself to the world and show myself to unbelievers in my miracle power to do things that only I can do. That's why I gave you that treasure in earthen vessels. So when the power manifests, people would see that it was me. So don't be afraid to walk in my miracle power. Don't be afraid to walk in the higher levels of faith. Don't be afraid to let me use your life to manifest unusual and powerful things for I desire to glorify myself by manifesting my miracle power in your life and all shall see and believe and it is those very miracles that will cause them to turn to me. 
says the spirit of the living God. Oh Lord, amen and amen. So what I need you to understand, there's some more verses I had to do, but I have to start wrapping up. What I need you to understand, let's review, and then I'm gonna do the very last thing. Number one, uh, the title of tonight's No More Genius is Where Are the Miracles? Point number one, Satan and religious people go fight this. What do they have to offer you? <laughs> what do they have to offer you? The reason they fight it is because the miracle power of God glorify, glorifies him the most. But number two, because you can't win without God's miracle power as a Christian. Okay. Uh, next point, miracles are the norm for the Christian. We're supposed to walk in them out of Jesus's own mouth. That doesn't mean you do foolish things like tempting God, but it does mean you can do everything the Bible says you can do. Okay. But how exactly do they work? You have to be in submission to everything God is saying. You have to be obedient and believing. You can't just be doing anything you want to do and think God's power is going to flow through that. Okay. So if you came on the broadcast late, go back to the top of the broadcast because you need to watch this from the beginning. You need to watch the broadcast from the beginning so you can get all the principles. Now, here is what I'm going to finish this up with tonight. Here's where I'm closing out with. I'm going to read you a chronological list of the miracles of Jesus. You have probably never heard them all in one space in one time. And I also want to say before I read this list that remember John said that Jesus did way more than they listed in the Bible. John said the Lord did so much that you know the world itself couldn't contain the books that would be written. John said we wrote about everything Jesus did. Do you understand what John just told you? What that means is that for all the miracles we see in the scripture, the Lord actually did more than that. Here it comes. First, he was born to a virgin. His mama was a virgin and the Lord got to pick his parents. That's a miracle. Changing water into wine at the wedding of Cana. Healing of the royal official son. Healing of the Capernaum demoniac. Healing of Peter's mother-in-law. Healing the sick during the evening. Catching a large number of fish. Healing a leper. Healing a centurion's servant healing a paralyzed man, healing a withered hand, raising a widow's son, calming the storm, that's the famous peace be still, healing the Gerasene man possessed by demons, healing a woman with internal bleeding, that's the woman with the issue of blood, raising Jairus' daughter, because he was on his way to raise Jairus' daughter when the woman with the issue of blood came up behind him and grabbed his robe, healing two blind men, healing a man that was demon possessed that was mute, healing a 30 year old that has never walked in his whole life, feeding 5,000 men and their families, walking on water, healing many people in Genesaret, healing a girl possessed by a demon, healing a deaf man with a speech impediment, feeding 4,000 men and their families, healing a blind man, healing a man born blind, healing a demon possessed boy, catching a fish with a coin in his mouth, healing a blind and mute man who was once demon possessed, healing a woman with an 18 year old infirmity. That was the woman in church that was bent over. She had a humpback. That was that one. Healing a man with dropsy, healing 10 lepers, raising Lazarus from the dead, healing Bartimaeus of blindness, uh, Jesus cursed a fig tree, restoring a severed ear. When he got arrested, Peter cut off Malchus's ear and Jesus glued it back. His own resurrection, catching 153 fish after the Lord resurrected and gave Peter another miracle of fish, and then the Lord ascending. There's more miracles than that because remember the Lord cast seven devils out of Mary Magdalene. So I didn't even list them all. I listed 40. There's even more. You probably never heard all that in one place at one time, and the Lord did way more than that in his three and a half year ministry. So what's my point? My point is that we're supposed to be walking in that too. That is the normal. That is the normal for us as believers. Oh, there's my cousin. It's the head of my cousin. That is the normal for us as believers. So I know you want to say, why don't more people walk in that? And the answer to that question is I gave you the answer in Romans chapter 10, because you've got to hear it preached to you. You've got to hear it prophesied to you. You've got to hear it talk to you. And then when you hear it preached, prophesied, and taught, it's not going to do you any good if you don't believe it, because you must participate in your own miracle. 
So what you have to do is develop your faith. And the way you develop your faith is regularly hearing, preaching and teaching and prophesying about the miraculous, but then you have to say it. You have to start confessing what the Bible says and you have to expect it. You have to expect God to move because ain't nothing going to happen until you expect it. Ain't nothing going to happen until you believe it. But we got that prophetic rhema word from the Lord who says he desires to move in our lives in the miraculous. He desires to move in our lives through miracles because that's what glorifies him the most, where he can show his power. Okay? He can show his power and all that see that power will believe. And I gave you some of my testimonies earlier in the broadcast. So if you came on late, go back earlier in the broadcast. I gave you some of my personal testimonies. Okay? My personal testimonies that the Lord did for me and my family. That's what I'm trying to get you to understand, that all that stuff that the Lord is talking about, I've experienced it in my life. That's what I'm saying. It's not something removed. I'm not talking at you. I'm talking with you, believer to believer, about things that the Lord has done for me and through me and with me. And if that's the case, if you did it for me, he'll do it for you. Okay? So go back to the top of this message and listen from the beginning. You need to play this message over and over and over again. And so what I'm going to ask you to do, remember I told you every video I'm going to ask you to do one thing? What I'm going to ask you to do is share this video with as many people as you can. As many people as you can that know to hear, that need to hear the teaching about the miracle power of God, share this video as many places as you can so they can begin to develop their faith because we're supposed to be walking in this. The Lord wants us to walk in this. The Lord is desirous to show his power in us as we walk in the miracle power of God. All right. Amen and amen. That's our time for tonight. Uh, thank you so much to those of you that watch me live. Thank you so much to those of you that are watching on the replay. Thank you so much to those of you that are sharing this video. Now, I don't do what I do for money, but many people have asked me, how can they bless uh, my ministry? I put my Zelle in the chat. Uh, if you'd like to bless me financially, you can send a financial contribution there. Uh, I'm not doing this for money. I'm doing this because the Lord called me to do it. But a lot of people like to sow into my ministry because they've asked me. So you can sow to that zeal. So thank you so much. Uh, you know, I'm excited. Whenever the word of God comes through you, it also comes to you. So I'm excited about what, about what the Holy Ghost is doing. I'm excited about what the, what the Lord wants to do. I'm excited about walking in higher levels of faith. I'm excited about walking in higher levels of miracles with Christ, okay? So praise God. Thank you so much for tuning in. Don't forget to share this video. Now, I will be here Sunday, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time, my regular time. Sunday, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time, my regular time for my regular weekly live prophetic word. And you hear me say it every week. You need the prophetic in your life. You need the prophetic in your life. You need a prophetic in your life because we always need a right now word from God. Lord, what are you saying right now? Lord, what do you want to do right now? That's how you get away from the tragic trap of tradition where you stuck on what God said 20 years ago. And you hear a rhema word what the Lord is saying right now. You need a prophetic in your life. So I'll be here Sunday on my post because I'm proud and I'm happy for God to use me Sunday, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time for the next weekly live prophetic word, okay? Amen and God bless. And remember, it is time for us as believers to walk in miracles.